Ready when you are. Uh, forgot everything you told me to say, so I'll just say... <laughs> what the hell happened in Texas last week? All right, hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. This is going to be a very short episode. Last week was a dangerous disaster here in Texas, and uh, one that emphatically did not need to happen. And so um, the goal of this short, impromptu, uh, unplanned, unscripted video is to unpack it briefly. So um, here we go. So a weather event happened last week. We had a polar vortex. Um, they are not completely unusual, but I have a, a panel of esteemed uh, brains here collected. Do any of you want to try to make a quick commentary or metaphor about what happened weather-wise? Normally, there's a whole bunch of cold air that sits on top of the planet. And <laughs> as hot air rises up toward the poles, it can sometimes disrupt the jet stream and dislodge some of that super cold Arctic air, uh, which is what happened. The jet stream shifted, pulled a bunch of that Arctic air down uh, out, of, out of the frozen north and across uh, the U.S. Um, and it hit uh, Texas kind of like square in the face. Um, <laughs> temperature anomalies, I think, were something like 50 or 60 degrees below average. So next thing is the grid was not prepared to deal with this weather. Texas has its own electricity grid. You've probably heard a lot about ERCOT, uh, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, and have probably cursed their name uh, in the past <laughs> week. It's certainly an and ironic name. And uh, Texas is not connected to any of the other grids in the US. So we're sort of our own island. Uh, that was by design. Uh, so we wouldn't be regulated by the feds. Um, and that has subsequently, that, that very much limits the ability for us to lean on other neighbors uh, for grid support. We need more energy. And what happened fundamentally was that demand exceeded the supply of available electricity and that happened for two reasons. One, demand was at an all-time high for the winter because of the ultra-cold weather uh, and the majority of heating in Texas being electrically driven. Uh, and the other issue was uh, a decline in the available supply of electricity. So there was a significant amount of generation, electrical generation that was not available to generate electricity during the time when we needed it the most. So the grid was unprepared partly because the power plants were unable to produce power. Can you offer us any insight into why that was? Sure. So a lot of the issues stem from the lack of winterization. After mm -hmm. this happened before in 2011, the federal regulators basically said, there are some things that y'all could do to winterize your power plants and make them more reliable in cold weather because that same 50 degrees below average temperature hits Ohio, Pennsylvania, and areas farther north where I am. Other than the unavoidable, a tree got ice and fell on a power line because right. there's not much you can avoid with those. Our power plants keep operating when it's minus 10 because we do basic things like insulate piping put in heaters to make sure backup fuel sources stay warm. Even the more traditional sources of electricity, a thermal plant, burn coal, natural gas combined in simple cycles, nuclear plants. You boil water, it makes steam. Steam goes through a turbine, spins a generator. Great. But at some point you have to condense that steam back to liquid water so you can boil it again. Well, you gotta reject heat to do that. So that requires either surface water and you cool off heating up a lake or you pump water through a cooling tower and it blows the heat away. Well, a lot of those surface water intakes get right. fouled by surface ice because they're right at the surface. It's Texas. It doesn't freeze very often. And those <laughs> cooling better. towers have a lot of piping that's not insulated or heat traced. So it can form ice and reduce the cooling water flow. When thermal power plants cannot cool, they reduce capacity because they can't push as much steam and make as much power. Right. Or if it freezes entirely, you, that power plant just goes offline. 
it's just not available. Okay, what about uh, the fuel oil reserves or? Uh... The backup fuel oil is, uh, fuel oil is usually kept as a backup for diesel combustion engines, standard internal combustion engines, or at uh, cell towers and such, or at big plants. It's also used as a backup fuel on combustion turbines when, say, natural gas needs to be diverted to cities to keep people warm. If you're prepared and you've put in essentially kerosene as the fuel additive, you should be fine. But if you've not done that for the last 100,000 gallons of diesel refills when you test it, that fuel will gel or cloud at around 20 degrees above zero Fahrenheit. Yikes. Which makes it non-pumpable. And then you can't use it to burn anything in the combustion turbine and make heat to spin the generator. That can really gum up the works until the whole tank gets warm again. So bottom line, they weren't ready for cold weather. Um, what about wind turbines? Wind turbines, uh, we put them in the North Atlantic where, you know, icebergs make and stay and sink, it's pretty cold there. sinkable ships. It gets really cold there. So the spinning surfaces where the rotor meets the nacelle and the nacelle meets the support structure and where each of the blades meets the rotor all those rotational surfaces are susceptible to freezing with a quarter of an inch of freezing rain or ice. You have to order the heat protection package or the heat trace package from, say, GE for those larger wind turbines. Most of the ones that are up north get that heat trace package. Right. A lot of the ones that went offline and froze just didn't have that option when they were purchased to save upfront cost. We'll skip the water grid, which also failed spectacularly um, for now. Let's get into the homes, right? So um, what about our homes, right? Our homes are absolutely where we were busy sheltering in place and also sheltering from the storm. Any comments on why it was our homes failed? And then we'll go into what we could do about it. So from a, from a thermal enclosure standpoint, um, we didn't have the insulation necessary for really cold weather. Right. Um, we typically don't have the insulation necessary for weather that's not quite so cold. It just happens so infrequently. And when it does happen, when it drops below freezing locally or even in the high 30s, it's typically for a few hours. Right. Um, and then you might have 70 degrees the same day. Um, and we're used to in this climate of basically living outdoors, right? We can. The, the spring and the fall are perfect. We can have uninsulated stick frame houses or minimally insulated or code minimally insulated stick frame houses. We can open the windows, we can open the doors. It's all great. Um, summer and winter, we might close them. We might turn on the system, but we're basically relying on the system to provide comfort in the summer and winter. Um, as in the active um, electricity using system as opposed to the passive thermal resistive system of the enclosure. Yeah. So you can maintain a comfortable indoor environment in one of two ways. You can keep the heat that's there from leaving or you can produce new heat. Um, same, same, in the, same, same goes for the summer. Um, only one of those options is available without power and that's your enclosure. So if we have strategies like thermal mass, which is not, not very common, if we have strategies like well-insulated enclosures, um, walls, roofs, floors, um, we can maintain that heat and we can maintain that comfort a lot longer. Probably not the full uh, three or four days that some people lost power for, but definitely a day or two. And that's gonna be the vast majority of situations that we're gonna end up dealing with. Yeah, so fundamentally, our homes are set up, they're reliant on an uninterrupted stream of high energy density fuel, electricity and gas. So the interesting thing is that, you know, a lot of you listening, if you're listening, you're probably a self-selecting group of people that are involved in designing buildings, designing homes too. Um, so that is really the, the key here is the way we approach the design of homes uh, can change, it's ready to change. So Kate, what are we doing here at Positive Energy to help um, people prepare for uninterrupt for power interruptions and things like this? So the main products that we have that deal with uh, these two realms are the passive 
systems environmental design um, product. And in that one, we um, focus a lot on thermal comfort. Um, and that results mostly from um, your proximity to windows. So we look into a lot about the light and the heat that's coming from your windows and when it's desired versus when it's too much. Yeah. Um, and conversely, we also um, look into enclosures and we recommend um, different types of enclosures based on your climate. Anything else you want to add to the passive systems reports, Corey? I think that covers it. We, we really focus on kind of providing comfort without mechanical systems as much as possible, using right. what we have naturally from our, um, from our climate um, and the materials that we can apply to the project. So I guess fundamentally what we're trying to do with these systems is take some of the, some of the invisible, right? What's behind the wall that you never get to see and um, make people conscious of these decisions and their impacts. So you might not see the insulation that doesn't mean it's not working. Doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Um, so hopefully we can um, help bring these ideas to light. But we don't we don't pay attention to our insulation because we don't interact with it. But it is it is right around me right now all the time, impacting my comfort, impacting my experience. And you interact with it when it's twenty degrees outside. Nick, our cold boy. Oh boy, I was really glad. Like this is this room here has single pane windows over there and double pane here. Huge difference. Huge huge difference. So um, last topic is, of course, resilience. Resilience means being able to function in the presence of unexpected outages, unexpected shortages. Um, Corey, you want to talk about our resilient systems that we're, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of people interested in them recently. Yeah, so, I mean, a good enclosure and, 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 and well-designed passive systems pair very nicely with um, active resilient systems. Um, Fundamentally, this is about this idea, which is increasingly obvious to more and more people that the grids are not always gonna be there for us. And the miracle of hitting a switch or turning a faucet and having lights and having water is just that, it's a miracle. <laughs> um, and just because it's always been there in your past doesn't mean it'll always be there in your future. So we need to have those great enclosures so we can maintain heat if kind of intermittent disruptions but we also need to have backup systems if we want to sur uh, survive, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we want to be comfortable or even survive for longer periods. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So that's solar and batteries, um, understanding energy use. So we can replace yeah. um, the power grid when it's not available. Um, and the same with water. And what's great about these systems is they are perpetual, right? Batteries store energy based on generation from solar panels. It's not a generator where you have a tank of fuel and then as you um, use it down, you're gonna run out one day. It's not a cistern that's not connected to anything with, which, which has a set amount of water in it, right? We can size these systems to the local climate and infrastructure so that they can function perpetually into the future, supplying water and energy um, at, at any quantity that's necessary for unlimited amounts of time. Um, so I want to thank you guys, all, all of you. You're very impromptu, very brave. There's no script here. There was no uh, deep plan. And uh, we really felt like it was very important to get this message out and quickly and to get us thinking about, frankly, the design process as a technology itself that can be um, thought about to help prevent, frankly, dangerous, very dangerous situations from from being as bad as they were last week here in Texas. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you all for being on this call. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, of course, Miguel, for your leadership and all.